The Bridges of Kenningsberg is generally regarded as the first problem in graph theory. Hamilton's Icosian game should be regarded as the second problem in graph theory, although it's generally posed as the traveling sales representative problem. A sales representative has a region that includes a number of cities. Plan an itinerary that visits all cities and returns to the starting point with least total cost. Since there's usually nothing preventing travel between any two cities, we assume the cities form a complete graph on n vertices, so the graph theory version is, given a weighted complete graph on n vertices, find a least weight Hamilton circuit. So here's an obligatory joke. A mathematician, a physicist, and an engineer were staying in a hotel. Uh, never mind, it's too long of a joke. But the key idea, mathematicians usually care about whether a solution exists. And in this case, the obvious solution is to check all possible routes and select the shortest one. We could view an algorithm as a machine that takes an input of size n and produces an output that corresponds to the problem solution. Mathematicians mostly care that the machine exists, that there is some method of solving the problem. Everyone else cares about how long it's going to take. Since an algorithm can be completely described, the number of steps required to complete it is some function of the size of the input. The time complexity of the algorithm is a description of the type of function. Now, fair warning, what follows shouldn't be regarded as a proper introduction to time complexity. It's what you should know to make sense of what follows. To give you some insight of how this works, let's try to estimate the time complexity of the standard algorithm for the addition of two n-digit numbers, where we'll use the number of digits as the size of the input. So to add two n-digit numbers, we have to add n pairs of numbers, the digits of the numbers. And it's possible we may end up with a carry digit, which would require, at worst, another n additions. So the time complexity is 2n, and note that this is a linear function. An algorithm runs in polynomial time if the number of steps can be expressed as a polynomial in the size of the input. Generally speaking, we only care about the largest, the highest degree term. For example, let's find the time complexity of the standard algorithm for multiplication of two n-digit numbers, and again, we'll let n be the input size. When multiplying two n-digit numbers using the standard algorithm, we need to multiply n digits of one factor by each digit of the second factor for n squared multiplications. And then we have to do a bunch of additions. While we could determine the time complexity of the additions, we've already found that addition has linear time complexity. Since the multiplication steps have quadratic time complexity, we'll ignore the additions and conclude that multiplication has quadratic time complexity. We often express time complexity using something called big O notation. This identifies the fastest growing part of the time complexity function. For example, the standard algorithm for addition has time complexity 2n, so it's O n, it's a linear function. The standard algorithm for multiplication has time complexity n squared plus some linear functions, but the biggest part is the n squared part. And the standard algorithm for division is also order n squared. We generally regard polynomial time algorithms as efficient. That's because they don't get significantly harder as the input size increases. For example, if an n-cube time algorithm takes one hour for n equals 1,000, then it will take one hour and 10 seconds for n equals 1,001. There are other functions. In contrast, an exponential time algorithm is generally regarded as inefficient, and that's because they get significantly harder as the input size increases. For example, if a 3 to the n time algorithm takes 1 hour for n equals 1,000, 
it will take 3 hours for n equals 1001. And that's because 3 to power 1001 is 3 times 3 to power 1000, so it takes 3 times as long. One way to solve the traveling sales representative problem is to list all possible routes and choose the shortest one. If there are n cities, there are n factorial possible routes to check. So this brute force approach has factorial complexity. So if it takes one hour for n equals 1000, it will take six weeks for n equals 1001. And that's because 1001 factorial is 1001 times 1000 factorial, so it takes 1001 times as long. And if we go up to n equals 1002, it will take more than 100 years to go through all of them. Let's consider another aspect of the problem. If you're given a solution, can you verify that it is in fact a solution? This is a situation that's rather unique to mathematics, where the solution to a problem often gives no insight into how to solve the problem. For example, if I want to factor 682,360,691, that's difficult to do, but if I claim there is a factorization, it's easy to verify. A problem whose solution can be found in polynomial time is categorized as complexity class P for polynomial. For example, the problem multiply two numbers is class P, since a polynomial time algorithm exists. But factoring a number is more difficult. Without going into the details, the standard algorithm actually has exponential complexity. However, a proposed factorization can be verified in polynomial time. More generally, if the solution to a problem can be verified in polynomial time, regardless of how long it takes to solve the problem, it is in class NP for non-deterministic polynomial. So again, consider the factorization problem. We can verify a factorization in polynomial time, so this is an NP problem, but the naive algorithm for finding a factor is exponential. So the question you have to ask is, given an NP problem, does a polynomial time algorithm exist? Or is it impossible to find such an algorithm? Or more succinctly, does P equal NP? Most people suspect the answer is no. So let's consider the traveling sales rep problem. If someone presents a solution to the problem, you can verify it by checking every possible Hamilton circuit. And this is just as hard as solving the problem in the first place. So in some sense, this problem is even harder, since it's not only hard to solve, but it's also hard to verify that a solution is correct. Since the problem is hard to begin with, and it appears to be just as hard to check, what if we didn't care if we found the best solution? What if we just wanted to find the best solution we could find? So let's take a look at that. 